Well, thank you very much for this introduction, and obviously, thank you very much all for coming. Um, yeah, I'm, speaking at EA conference is always one of my favorite activities, uh, seeing so many effective altruists coming together and exchanging ideas, uh, discussing new topics. It's always, you know, very, very inspiring. And we as effective altruists obviously have still a whole lot to do. Although if you actually look at society nowadays, you realize that in some uh, regards, they already agree with some of the core principles of effective altruism. Let me give you one example. If you look at modern hero stories in blockbuster movies, you'll usually notice that they have three things in common. First, there's a really huge problem threatening humanity or maybe the whole existence of planet Earth. Second, the hero usually is totally indispensable. So, you know, in terms of replaceability, it's really zero. If you look, you know, Armageddon, for example, you know, Bruce Willis taking care of things, it could not have been Mel Gibson or Schwarzenegger. I mean, would not have worked. And last but not least, they don't only solve the problem a little bit, you know, reducing it by 10%, you know, the chance of the asteroid hitting planet Earth. No, usually what they do, the heroes in these stories, they get rid of the problem completely. And these three components is actually also what makes a f large part of the framework of work for effective altruists. Because when we decide which problems to focus on, we usually ask ourselves three questions. Um, the first one is being scale, which means, come here. The first one is being scale or importance. So how big is the problem that we think we should be targeting on? The second is neglectedness or replaceability. So how many people are already working on this problem or what difference do we think we can make? Do we have any advantage to work on this particular problem? And last but not least, what has been called tractability or solvability, how much of the problem can we actually get rid of? You know, can we solve it, you know, maybe, because it doesn't make sense to have a huge problem like an asteroid hitting the planet if you cannot really do something against it. You might rather focus on a smaller problem where you can make a bigger impact. And this framework usually helps us to define uh, and work, uh, you know, to decide on which cause uh, in, to, to focus on, which problems. Because obviously there are millions and millions of problems. You know, one, for example, that I recently struggle with quite a bit is the following. You might be able to relate. Um, but you know, just looking at the first criteria you are, you know, in terms of scale and importance, we probably realize, okay, you know, devoting one's life to fixing that problem. I mean, you know, maybe Steve Jobs get excited about it, uh, but I think there are other jobs to do. And um, what usually has, you know, has emerged over the last years. Um, is, is three topics. One of them is global poverty, which I think most effective altruists agree that it's a big problem. Second one being uh, animal suffering. And thirdly, existential risks, you know, in terms of asteroids, artificial intelligence, or whatnot. And then what we usually do, you know, we have identified these huge cause areas, and then, you know, to, to decide what to do about them, um, we create meta charities. So, for example, in the case of global poverty, uh, GiveWell was created. And then GiveWell takes a look at global poverty, what is, what is at the root at, uh, at global poverty, and which NGOs and which interventions are the best to solve the problem of global poverty. And then we do the same for animal suffering. There is a meta charity, which is called Animal Charity Valuators. And again, they look at which NGOs and which interventions are the best to reduce animal suffering. And the same with the Center for the Study of Existential Risks, uh, looking at what kind of problems are there and what interventions and what NGOs would, it, would it be the best to do. And this approach obviously has worked, you know, really well over the last few years. You know, we have been able to make tremendous progress in terms of, you know, reducing global poverty, reducing animal suffering, and getting closer to understanding the existential risks of humanity. However, this approach also come with, comes with two caveats. And if you, uh, you know, you can already become a bit clear if you actually, uh, you know, if you look at the lines that I draw, that this is a very, you know, very focused approach. You know, you first look at one cause and then try to, to work within that cause. And there are two, two ways in which this can be a bit problematic. The first 
let me explain. Um, if you look at one cause, and I'm just, you know, very abstractly just defining it at cause A, and there, you know, you have the list of interventions that you can do to, to work in this cause. And let's say there's one intervention, the red intervention, Y, uh, that is the best intervention in this area. So let's, let's define it in the sense that, you know, it's 100% it's in terms of being the most e efficient in this area. So, uh, but then at the same time, this very intervention, when we look at cause B, is actually having, does have a negative impact in cause, in cause B and maybe as well in cause C. So if we were to like draw an overall conclusion of this intervention, we would actually realize it's not as good as it seems. It's, you know, if you add up the numbers, you know, just as an example, you would probably get to like 70. So, you know, not as, as great as, you know, what it, what it looked like initially when just looking at cause A, which obviously a meta charity focusing cause A would do. And to give you one example, you know, where there are negative externalities, you might have heard of this story, um, Bill Gates donating 100,000 uh, chicken to help, to help the poorest people in Africa. And obviously there were a lot of discussion, is this actually, you know, a, a very efficient way to help the poorest? And, you know, this is not part of the discussion now, but um, nobody actually discussed what about the chickens. Uh, which, you know, but obviously we also care about animal suffering, so it doesn't really make sense. And even if this was a, would be like a highly effective intervention to reduce animal suff uh, you know, uh, the, you know, global poverty, uh, we would still need to take into consideration what's happening um, to animals or generally in other causes. The other way um, this thinking can, can cause problems, if we have an intervention, like you have intervention number Z here, or Z, um, that is not really in the top three of any of the causes, you know, but it does have positive impacts in a variety of causes. And so actually if you compare, if you compare the two, you would actually realize that you're looking at the whole world, you know, while intervention Z, which is not really being focused on in any of the causes, with overall actually is better than intervention Y, um, which is really good in one cause, but is having negative impacts on other causes. So what are some examples of, you know, this way uh, our thinking can go wrong? Um, one, for example, is, you know, making decision uh, making better. You know, there's the center for, you know, there are, there are a lot of research being done how much, how much negative impact is made to the world because people make the wrong decisions. They don't act rational, rational. They, they might be, you know, maybe too emotional, might be, you know, being, too, you know, because of all the cognitive biases. And there is now, um, we have created as a movement, a center for, the, uh, for applied rationality, which take exactly care of this. You know, making sure that decisions are being, you know, being done more rationally. Even though, you know, if you ask GiveWell or animal charity evaluators, they would never recommend, you know, donating to the Center for, effect, for Applied Rationality uh, because, you know, it's, it, it's not the most effective intervention within that specific cause. But we as a movement, you know, believe that it really makes sense to improve decision making. And another cause area which I'm going to... Um, you know, uh, that I'm focusing on is actually our high consumption of meat and other animal products. Now, some of you might say, hey, wait a minute, don't we have, uh, don't we have animal charity evaluators for that? And yes, to some extent we do. Because if you look at animal charity evaluators, they looked at the numbers on the numbers of, or the, of the animals being used and killed according to the different forms of exploitation due to humans. They're not looking into wild animal suffering, but if they're you know, looking how many animals are being killed because of clothing, how many because of vivisection, how many animals are being killed for you know, cats and dogs that are being euthanized. And as you can see in the graphic, it's pretty clear, you know, it's you know, pretty much all the, all the you know, the whole area is, you know, blue. So, you know, 99% of the victims, you know, that's the statistics from the US, uh, of animal victims are, are done because, because of what we eat. And this is obvious, and this is also one of the reasons why animal charity evaluator focuses on farms animals and not on, you know, helping to make, you know, the lives of cats and dogs better. Uh, however, when you, when you want to improve, when you want to reduce animal suffering, there are usually, you know, there are different ways. One of which 
is being, you know, increasing welfare standards, which for example means, you know, something that OPP has been putting quite a focus on, the Open Philanthropy Project, in, you know, getting the, the worst conditions for animals improved. For example, getting rid of caged, uh, caged eggs facility, you know, uh, hence, egg-laying hens are being confined in tiny cages, and you can push industries and, and companies to, you know, to, to widen, to open them up, and create facilities like this. And obviously, you know, the thinking goes that this improves the lives, you know, of each chicken, at least to some extent, which, you know, if you make it in the whole, in the whole country or in the whole industry, you know, reduces a lot of animal suffering. However, there are also other ways to reduce animal suffering. It is, for example, means helping people to shift away from, you know, relying on animal products completely and, you know, promoting a more plant-based diet, you know, you know, telling people that it's actually, you know, can be fun to, to eat more veggies or in another sense to, you know, promote the development of uh, meat alternatives or other alternatives to animal products. And if you now compare these two, like usually, or traditionally, if you look from a purely uh, animal suffering perspective, the activities on the left are usually more, somewhat more cost effective because you, know, you can waste you know, millions of, uh, the, the lives of millions of animals while obviously you know, developing meat alternative or you know, helping people to shift their diets is more like a, a, it's, it's a more, you know, more long-term endeavor. However, there are obviously more benefits on the right side by, you know, shifting, by people shifting their diet or, you know, reducing their consumption of animal products. So uh, to, to give you a brief overview, uh, there is a, a paper, for example, in the Stanford Environmental Law Journal, which, you know, boldly states a leading cause of everything. One industry that is destroying our planet and our ability to thrive on it. So in detail, they write, Climate change, ocean dead zones, fishery depletion, species extinction, deforestation, world hunger, food safety, heart disease, obesity, diabetes. The list goes on. There is one issue at the heart of all, all these global problems that is too often overlooked by private individuals and policymakers alike. Our demand for and the reliance on animal products. And interestingly, in the whole list he actually doesn't even mention animal suffering, which as we as effective altruists consider to be like the largest part of the problem, at least at this point. So, uh, you know, I would actually, you know, I, I would not really agree that it's the leading cause of everything, but let's look at the actual numbers, what it means. So we've already seen that when it comes to, you know, somewhat trying to quantify animal suffering, at least human-made animal suffering, that, you know, 95% of them are actually due to the way we raise and treat animals because we want to eat them. So this, you know, makes a huge proportion. If we look at climate change, you know, studies tell us, depending on the time frame we're looking in, looking at, that about 15 to 30 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions are due to our reliance on animal products for food. If you look at rainforest destruction, you can see that, you know, a lot of the rain, or uh, 80 percent of the Amazonian rainforest uh, deforestation are due to uh, raising cattle or, you know, creating feeds that are being fed to animals. If you look at loss of biodiversity, we are about at 70 percent. Freshwater depletion, it's about 30 percent. World hunger, I mean, that's obviously a very complex issue, but it's important to notice that about 35 percent of the, of the global harvest in terms of grain, of corn, or whatever, is not being used to fed uh, directly people, but it's being used to fed livestock, be, which is an extremely inefficient way to, to create calories or protein. And with all those, you know, very inefficiency and, you know, resource um, wasteful uh, behaviors, you know, it's also clear that, pro you know, that there's more of a, that more of violent conflicts in the future are also going to link to this kind of behavior because, you know, Researchers predict that more and more of global res uh, conflicts are caused because are caused because of scarcities. So you know, so next to religion or other causes, because you know there is not enough water, there is not enough land because of climate change, then people have to migrate. So this also plays a big role. Also, when it comes to human health, uh, that's for example uh, in Germany, about one third of the health costs are diet related. So that's obviously also makes a big impact. And then also when we look at epidemics, 
know a lot of discussions about antibiotics resistance. It's important to notice that 70% of the antibiotics uh, are used for farmed animals. So in terms of you know, creating antibiotic resistant superbugs, uh, you know, that's one very efficient way to produce them. And last but not least, there are actually some uh, academics and thinkers who also are making a good case that in terms of our moral values, you know, speciesism and carnism and sexism and racism are somewhat interlinked because they have common denominators creating like an in-group versus an out-group thinking, valuing the interests of the in-group differently than the interests of the out-group. And there have been, you know, numerous publications. Um, for example, uh, you might be familiar with Peter Singer's work. He already wrote about this in the 70s, about animal liberation, where he makes a, a good case, you know, comparing it with uh, sexism and racism attitudes. There is uh, the book The Sexual Politics of Meat from Carol J. Adams, and there's also the book from Why We Love Dog, Eat Pigs and Work Cows, an introduction to carnism uh, from Dr. Melanie Joy, where she also discusses the psychology of, um, of why we eat certain animals and not others. So, Summing this all together, I think we can agree that the scale of this problem, you know, our reliance on animal products is huge in scope. Can we maybe raise our hands? Who agrees that it looks like a big problem in the world, Jeff? Okay, good. So can, we can make a check mark on that. Okay, let's, let's take a next step. Let's, let's talk about neglected net. Like, how is, is that problem being neglected? So I already made a case why I believe that in uh, effective altruism, I believe it's somewhat neglected because of, you know, we, we have those, you know, global poverty, you know, we have a very, um, you know, focused approach, which sometimes tends to overlook if there's like a intercausal impact. Uh, but even when you look at like individual causes, you know, you would think that, you know, with all these problems, you know, one of these areas must really focus on this problem, but this is not the case. Let's look, for example, at at donations for animal causes. So we've already seen this statistics, you know, that 99% of the animals being used and killed um, are actually farmed animals, and animal charity evaluators also made another statistics, which is where do their donations go? And does anybody have a guess? Where do you think donations for animals go? Yes, shelters, exactly. If we do the same statistics uh, for, our, you know, if we you know, make a juxtaposition, we see that actually two-thirds of the donation go to cats and dogs, others is miscellaneous, and the light blue that's actually the farmed animals, you know, 99% of the victims, they get like, you know, 2% of the donations. So in the animal sector, you know, this is obviously highly, highly neglected, you know, especially in proportion to the actual size of the problem. Now, now you might think, well, what about the environmental movement? You know, climate change is a big thing, you know. But there was a recent publication in FIS.org about the most effective, individu uh, effective individual steps to tackle climate change that are not being discussed. So, you know, again, what is actually being highly neglected? And, um, you know, some of you might not be surprised, but uh, on the right-hand side, that is actually having, having fewer children, you know, having no children is the most effective intervention any individual can do to tackle climate change by a large, large margin, but also, you know, shif shifting to a more plant-based diet or completely to a plant-based diet is also regarded as a high impact and highly neglected cause area. And it's, it's actually funny how, how, how much environmental organization, you know, ignore the topic that there has even been a whole movie, a whole documentary being made, which is called Cowspiracy, uh, which actually taxes exactly that problem. They visit different environmental organizations and say, well, you care about the rainforest. Why is actually the rainforest being destroyed and what do you do about it? And interestingly, most organizations don't really want to want to discuss this topic and, you know, they rather focus on other issues. And then the same movie maker, uh, filmmaker made, made the same print, did the same thing uh, in the health sector, so targeting different health charities, going to them, oh, you are the, the you know, American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, you know, studies show there's an interlink, blah, 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 and again, it's being highly, highly neglected. I mean, you can actually, you can watch both documentary on Netflix, 
and it's really interesting to see. Obviously, there are, there are many reasons why you know, organizations are reluctant uh, to, to talk about the topic. In the movie, they often talk about you know, sponsor, corporate sponsorship, that you know, there is no interest to actually reduce the kind of consumption. But there's also like an underlying psychology behind this. And if you're more interested in that, there's a, a TEDx talk, um, again, by Melanie Choi, who, which discusses carnism, which is the invisible ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. And the talk is toward rational and authentic food choices. You can watch it on carnism.org. So given all these together, I think I can make the questions, who, who would think that this, or who would agree that this topic is highly neglected as a whole in our world? Yes, thank you very much. So we already have two out of three, so that's, that's, that's pretty good. So, so let's go to tractability, you know, so what, is there, I mean, can we actually solve the problem, you know, it, or is it, you know, something like an asteroid hitting the planet where we can nothing do about it? And obviously there are many, many, you know, cause areas, you know, and, you know, effective altruists are great at, you know, discussing the different priorities. And any cause can obviously, you know, easily be supported by a donation, you know, I mean, whether, you know, whether it's existential risk, global poverty, that's always an option you have. However, the with many other cause areas, it's actually, there's no, not so much one can do as an individual. You know, if I care about, you know, AI sec safety, there's not so much in my life that I can actually do. But when it comes to a plant-based diet, I can actually just, you know, reduce my consumption of animal products, and I'm already, you know, helping to be part of the solution. And the good thing about this is, you know, if you compare it with donations, every dollar, every euro you donate to one organization, you cannot donate to, to another one. So there's always going to be a high opportunity cost. But by reducing one's meat consumption and you know, changing one's diets, there is not really that much, you know, not that many opportunity costs. There might be maybe some initial effort to you know, find one's way around how to do it, but you know, it's not more expensive and it doesn't take more time. And so it's actually easy to be done. And uh, to put, put this uh, actually more nicely, I would like to, to quote one of my, uh, Heroes, Peter Singer, which many years ago already put it very, very nicely, and I'm going to read out his quote. I would not question the sincerity of vegetarians who take little interest in animal liberation because they give priority to other causes. So he acknowledges, you know, there might be other causes. However, but when non-vegetarians say that human problems come first, I cannot help wondering what exactly it is that they are doing for human being that compels them to continue to support the wasteful, ruthless exploitation of farmed animals. And so Singer's making exactly that case. You know, I mean, even if you care about human rights or AI safety, you know, in during your lunch break, you know, it does not harm the AI cause if you eat a veggie burger instead of a meat burger. So obviously that's, that's a great option. And then last but not least, because um, you know, it's so widespread eating animal products that even, you know, your, clo your, f your friends and your surrounding probably also like, you know, participate in it. So you can also make, have a very viral impact by impacting your, your direct environment. You know, for example, you know, if I care about AI safety and I talk to my mother on Christmas, I don't really know what to tell her. But if, I, if it goes about, you know, making the world a better place by eating plant-based, I have a very good idea what I can tell my mom to cook for dinner on Christmas Eve. And obviously, you know, to, to tackle this problem and, you know, to all, to, to get the most out of all these options that we have to make the world a better place by shifting our diets toward being more plant-based, uh, two colleagues of mine got together. That's one is on the left is uh, Tobias Leonard, also known as the vegan strategist. Um, he, he's going to be on a panel discussion uh, tomorrow. And on the right is my wife, Dr. Melanie Joy. And um, we, in total, we have, I think, more than 50 years of you know, vegan advocacy experience. And uh, Tobias recently uh, wrote a book which is uh, entitled How to Create a Vegan World. And uh, Melanie Joy, next to her book on, on carnism, the one that I showed beforehand, wrote a new book which is called Beyond Belief, which is about improving communication and relationship between meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. So those are some of the activities we do. And obviously, one thing that I'm going to discuss here is that we created an organization called ProVeg International. And 
it is an international, or we frame it as an international food awareness organization with the mission to reduce global animal consumption by 50% by the year 2040. Uh, in Germany, we have been previously active under the name of Vibu, or you know, Vegetarierbund, and we have been evaluated by animal charity evaluators to being one of the most efficient and effective organizations when it comes to reducing animal suffering. Though, as I just said, we actually don't really consider ourselves as an, you know, only as an animal charity, but as one uh, agency once put it, we are actually, you know, more like the um, Swiss army knife of NGOs, you know, tackling several problems at once, and we usually sum them up in five different categories, five pros that make up pro-veg. It's pro-animals, it's pro-environment, which obviously also means pro-future generations, pro-food justice, pro-health, and pro-taste. And those five reasons are actually, re or those five pros are good for two reasons. Because if we want to change society, uh, we can, it, it's helpful to look at this illustration. This is a bit what the world looks at the moment. So we have a spectrum from left, that's you know a very meat-based omnivorous diet, and on the right, we move towards a more vegan, plant-based diet. And the distribution of people at the moment is a bit like this. You know, most people eat meat. Uh, there are a few vegans all on the top, maybe a few vegetarians in the middle, but the majority eats meat. And uh, obviously, also, if you want to go vegetarian or vegan, it's an, it's an uphill battle. You know, you have to walk up, walk up quite a bit. Now, those five reasons that, we, that I mentioned, they can be used to increase individual motivations. You know, there are people who are motivated to reduce their meat consumption because of health issues, because they care about animals, because they care about the environment, uh, food justice, whatever. So we can use all these five reasons to motivate the people to gently, you know, move, move up that mountain. At the same time, we can use those five reasons to actually create institutional change. And what do I mean with that? This is like tapping into, you know, or, or one of the reasons why we do this is because the budgets are different in the different areas. Let me give you an example. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the weight we are adding by with the institutional uh, change. Um, so one of the reasons that we have all the, these other reasons for institutional change is if you look at the annual budget, and this is in Germany, but it's similar in other countries, then you notice that in terms of donation for animal charities or government funding for animal, you know, animal charities or anything like that, we are we actually we have a total budget of less than 300 million that go to animal charities, and that's actually mainly shelters. So that's actually mainly cats and dogs, as we've seen before. So the big figure, the sum that you saw, that's actually you know that's about the total sum. Now, if we look what people donate and what the government spends on developmental aid and world hunger relief we get to about 18 billion Euro dollars. So obviously that's a much, much bigger, bigger, uh, you know, bigger budget. And you know, we saw we can make a case why some of the budget actually should be channeled into you know, making people go more, more plant-based. If you look at how en environmental and climate change, it's about $40 billion that is you know, just in Germany being available for those causes. At the moment, it's not really used much for promoting more plant-based, but that's where, we, that's where we come in. And if you're talking about health, you know, the prevention and treatment of diet-related health issues, we're actually talking about 77 billion euros. So that's obviously huge, huge budget. So instead of being an animal charity that is, you know, trying to, you know, work with the budgets and, you know, taking budget away from cats and dog organization or other charities, we think it's, it's actually better to, to, to channel money that is, you know, used for, you know, for health and for climate and, and world hunger to, to make the diet change, which ideally, you know, helps us to level the playing field, which makes it easier for more and more people um, to reduce their, further reduce their consumption of meat and other animal products and ideally, you know, create a world that looks more like this, where the plant-based option is actually the default option, where the, doing the right thing is the easy thing. So, you know, even like the, the hardcore meat eater still on the left, you know, is having a really hard time keeping up with his meat consumption because avail availability is just, uh, just so, so ha has just decreased so much. Um, so, so how do we bring this change about? Our core strategy is influencing the influencer. So instead of, as I said, instead of, um, you know, instead of 
convincing one individual after the other. We want to make institutional change and we have defined six strategic target groups, which is the media, the food industry, chefs and caterers, politics and public, uh, uh, pu public policies, medicine and research, and activists and other NGOs. And with each, with, and with each of that strategic target group, we, you know, there are many players within target group. There we usually try to target the leader because you know, once we get the, the leader in an industry going in a certain direction or in the direction that we want him to go, usually the other follows. So let me give you a few examples where we have employed exactly this strategy. For example, in medicine, you know, it's, we, we saw there is a huge budget in terms of uh, health-related issues. So we, we, so we are targeting doctors, medical doctors, nutritionists. And we created a medical conference, which is, taking, which is called VegMed. And instead of us as Provid International doing it ourselves, we, we joined forces with Charité, which I guess most of you here know is one of the Europeans' leading research facility when it comes to health. And, uh, and, and, and doctors, and this has helped us to reach way more doctors, gain way more credibility, and you know, help to, to already start shifting the tide. We already implemented that idea when it came to generating a new curricula for the next generation of chefs. So uh, instead of targeting individual chefs, we targeted the, the culinary schools where the next generation of chefs are being trained. Uh, we developed cooking ma material, training materials, and again, we joined forces with the Euro Germany's largest, Europe, uh, largest cookery school, and we even received funding from the European Commission, not because they care about animals, but they, because they care about innovation and international collaboration and job security and blah, 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 and we were able to frame it in a way that they actually funded this principle. We also work with large-scale caterers, um, you know, big caterers like universities. We created a project which was called GV Nachhaltig, GV meaning for Gemeinschaftsverpflegung in German. And again, we couldn't manage to convince the Ministry of Environment to support us. Again, not because they care about animals, but they care about the environment. And we were invited, you know, by companies like Facebook, Microsoft, Mercedes, Google, to train the chefs that cook for the employees. So again, huge, huge leverage impact that we could, you know, all do yeah, to, to make changes. We also went to the world's largest uh, trade show for organic uh, food, which is called Biofach. It takes place every year in Nuremberg, and we have a huge exhibition area just for, for vegan food. Again, it's the world's largest fair, so we have a huge impact there. We were just this week, or actually currently, there is the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the world's largest book fair. We again have like a, a special exhibition area where we help publishers uh, or publishers to find vegan authors and vegan authors to find publishers to you know promote the creation of, of more vegan books. Um, we also created our own vegan fair which is called Veggie World and uh, we started only in Germany in one location but so far we have been spreading I think we are in seven different countries in 15, 16 different locations. Um, we work with uh, companies, uh, with meat companies. This is, for example, the Rügenwalder Mühle, which is one of the most, you know, most well-known meat companies. And they started to develop vegetarian and vegan products. We convinced them of that. And the interesting thing is, they even use the meat products that they sell. Like, if you open up the lid, as you can see on the left, they use it to promote their plant-based options or their vegetarian options. So, even if you don't care about vegan food, you just want to buy a piece of meat from your favorite meat manufacturer and, and then you get home, you open the lid and again you have the uh, you know, promotion for vegetarian options. Um, this cooperation was so successful that I was actually invited to speak at the German Meat Congress, which was you know, a, <laughs> a congress of, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and yeah, which was interesting because they first they were a bit reluctant to invite me, and then they invited me, and then uh, a few days before that, they actually said that I'm going to be the, the keynote speaker in the main hall in front of 400 people with getting 50 minutes to talk to them, which uh, was quite a challenge, but uh, I made a good case, you know, saying, you know, comparing it with Blockbusters and Netflix. I don't know if you know Blockbuster. It was a, 
uh, uh, DVD rental place that very much underestimated Netflix and uh, you know pretty much saying that if they if they don't really change their ways they're going to go out of business like Blockbuster did and um, I think at the end they said um, somebody raised their hand and says Mr. Joy I guess you can imagine that nobody likes you here <laughs> but the message that you are conveying is quite convincing and I think we as an industry really have to move forward and I'm happy to say that pretty much all meat companies in Germany, all major meat companies, now start developing vegetarian and vegan options. So that's quite good. We also make it easier for consumers to find those products. We have like the V-label, which some of you might have seen, with a very sharp increase in uh, companies and products that are being labeled. We also do a lot of lobbying. For many years, we have been part of the Climate Alliance in Germany, where we work with over 100 other NGOs who all care about climate. Again, they care about climate, but they don't care about nutrition. So in the end, we were allowed to, uh, to write the chapter on nutrition uh, in, the, in the recommendation for the, for the German government. And all these organizations actually agreed with our demand of reducing livestock by 50% in Germany. So we were quite happy about that. Obviously, we are uh, we're also working on COP23, which, you know, the, the big climate summit, which this year is going to take place in Bonn, and next year it's going to be in Poland, where we also have an office. Uh, we started a petition in trying to get, you know, policymakers to pay more attention to the interlink between nutrition and climate change. We are currently working on a project which is called Peak Meat, where we work with uh, a lot of, where we're doing a, uh, a survey amongst the 60 leading climate scientists uh, working together with uh, Harvard University and Oregon State University to say what climate scientists say when, pe when meat consumption should peak. And we assume, you know, the surveys are still being out, but obviously we, we assume that they agree that peak, uh, peak meat should happen, you know, in the next few years. Uh, we also initiated the, the World Plant Milk Day, which we started in a few countries, and we created our mainly Melanie and Tobias, the Center for Effective Vegan Advocacy, where Melanie and Tobias travel the world training activists, and they've been, you know, in many continents. They've been in Australia training activists. We recently had a training here in Berlin. They were in Peru. They were in Israel, South Africa. And so there's a lot of activities we can do, and obviously, you know, we already see a lot of change happening in Germany, and uh, as we're going more international, we hope to see this change seen internationally. So uh, looking back again at our things, I think we can make a huge difference when it comes to changing people's diet. We've already done so to a large extent, and you know, this is why I think this is also the case. And there are, as I mentioned before, three ways to become active, or at least three ways, is obviously, you know, if you haven't done so, you can reduce your consumption of animal products, or, you know, go vegetarian or all the way vegan. You can spread the word by talking to other people, you know, telling about your change. You can obviously work at an organization, you know, like, like us, but there are several ones others out there that do similar work. Um, to help spread the word and become an activist or a full-time activist, and obviously you can also make a donation. So whichever path you choose, you're being, you know, you're moving away from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. So uh, yes, in the name of the whole ProVeg team, that's our international team here, uh, I would like to, yes, express my thank you and thank you very much. Thank you very much for this talk and for your very important work. So we have uh, uh, only time, unfortunately, for one question. It's from uh, Richard Schmeling, and he asked, how can money donations actually help farmed animals? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, if it really goes, I mean, is it, who have, is it farmed animals or is it the veg cars now? Okay, farmed animals. I mean, there are a lot of interventions, like, for example, like I said, you know, shift, for example, corporate outreach, helping, you know, moving companies to, to get from, you know, very cruel interventions to, to changing the, the way animals are being raised. So that's very, one, very common, you know, shifting uh, away from caged eggs to free range eggs, for example, and that's, that's a very cost efficient way to reduce animal suffering. And as I said, you know, just uh, reducing animal consumption as a whole, because, you know, every animal 
or you know, it, there's a very clear link between animal consumption and how many animals are being raised. So if people start eating less animals, there are less animals being raised and obviously less animals who have to suffer. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We have a, a small thank you present for oh. you from the foundation. Okay. Um, thanks again for the talk.